I'm Mark Levy. I live in New Hope, Pennsylvania, in a in a, a, a in a ten acre farm uh, here, a farmhouse from 1748. I love history, which is why I was so fascinated before with what tortilla is that uh, uh, was saying. And so what I am is I'm a, and forgive me if I repeat myself slightly from before. So I'm a differentiation expert. I differentiate corporations and brands and thought leaders. I help them come up with what I call their big sexy idea, the signature idea, the idea they're gonna be known for throughout the marketplace. And the ideas my clients and I have come up with for them have been written about and bought and talked about by hundreds of millions of people throughout the world. I've worked with people on TV shows. I've worked with people like Simon Sinek of Start With Why, people like that, you know, people, uh, entertainers and, and things of that nature. And the way I came to free writing um, years ago, 20 odd years ago, I had a writing degree uh, from Queens College in, in Queens, New York. Our most distinguished graduate was Jerry Seinfeld. So that that's how this... That's how uh, scholarly Queens College is. Uh, um, and so um, I had a degree in writing, but I didn't use writing a lot when I, after I left from school. And so a few years out of school, a friend of mine named Alvin, he was an editor of an entertainment uh, newspaper. And he said, Mark, I have free tickets for you to see Paul Weller. Now, Paul Weller, some of you may know, some of you may not, he was the leader of the jam, the British punk rock group from the, from the late 1970s and 80s or so, and the style council or whatnot. And Paul Weller was my idol, and he had not been to America like in 10 years, and I didn't know if he'd ever come again. So I said to Alvin, yeah, please give me the tickets. But Alvin said, here's the key. You're going to have to write about the concert for me. Like, that's the key. I'll give you the tickets if you write about the concert. And I said, okay, I don't know when I'll see Weller again. So yeah, give me the tickets. But the thing was, I hadn't written in many years. I didn't know if I still knew how to write. And I thought to myself, and how do you write about music? Do you go like the drum goes, ba-dum, 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 ba-dum? You know, like, what do you do? How do you, like, I didn't know if I could write and I didn't know how to write about this subject. But I remembered that I had a book on my shelf called Writing with Power by Peter Elbow, who was a, a professor or maybe still is in Massachusetts. And it taught this thing called free writing, which was write this writing that was free from the normal rules that just allowed you to write without worrying too much about being interesting or staying on point or anything like that. So out of terror, that I didn't know what I was doing. I just grabbed that book and I read about it. And then I went to see the Weller concert and I wrote about it. And, you know, Alvin loved it and he gave me other gigs to do. And I wrote for the New York Times and things of that nature. So it was all through free writing. And the reason, by the way, I wrote my book. I've never done this at a talk. I've never held up my book, but it's so germane to this time. The reason why uh, I wrote my book is that while I was doing free writing, while I was writing about rock concerts and while I was writing about interviews I did with like Leonardo DiCaprio and people like that, as I was writing about these things, because free writing allows for digression of thought, I was actually writing about business problems I had in my business, you know, client projects and things. Like while I'm writing about Leonardo DiCaprio and Mark Wahlberg, you know, as I'm writing about these things, I'm straying into talking about differentiation and biz dev and all these kinds of things. And I would come up with answers to my business problems like while I was finishing this article on like a music group. So I'd have my music group article and I'd have solutions to my business problems all in the same uh, uh, setting. They were all in the same document. And I thought this is really interesting that free writing allows that kind of freedom of thought that it allows you to stretch and, and use the ideas everywhere. So I started to look for books on free writing, which did exist, but to see what books on free writing talked about how to use free writing for business and or how to solve business problems using free writing. And there was no such book. 20 odd years ago, that book did not exist. So I decided 
<laughs> to write my own book on it since it didn't exist. But it was really this idea. You may have heard this kind of idea before, but I wrote it because I wanted to know what it was I was going to say that I didn't know what it was I was going to say about like free writing and business. But I knew that if I sat there and used free writing as the main tool, which is what I did in writing this book, that I would come up with really good answers that I wouldn't have come up with if I just sat there and thought about it. Right. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. And that right. reflects what we experience. I would say so. Let's hear from the regular free riders. Yes. That's, that. Yes, for me, it's yeah. a, a huge change since last year and now, how my ideas, I enjoy the thing and it's coming really smoothly. So, yeah. yeah. I That's can awesome. say from my part, Mark, I have more access to stories from my childhood. And it's like my memory is getting better despite my increasing age, you know, because <laughs> it's... <laughs> which is pleasant because it's like, oh, oh I'm, I'm just, I'm able to remember better. And, and, right. that's, and I think it's linked to the free writing. Well, let me ask, do you remember better just while you're sitting there free writing or when you're out in the world doing your stuff? When I'm out in the world doing my stuff. Right. That's what I, I was asking you a leading question. <laughs> if you had given me the wrong answer, I would have told you you were wrong. So, because I find, I, I write about this in Accidental Genius. I, um, I, I quote a woman named Lou Willett Stanek in the book. She, she wrote a book on teaching fiction, but in the book, she, her quote was something like, stories happen to the people who can tell them. <laughs> you know, and like, I just thought that that was such a profound idea in the fact of of everyone on this call were storytellers. Like we need them, whether you're an architect, whether you know, you're a historian or you're an, you know, whatever it is that you're doing, you need to be able to tell stories, brand stories or stories about historical happenings or stories, you know, pitch stories or so. And to me, when you have to start creating story, you start, and you know you need to create story. You start to walk around in the mindset of story. You start putting things together that a normal person would not put together. Like they don't really go, but because you have to have something to write about or to pitch or to whatever, your mind sees connections that you wouldn't have seen if you didn't have to do that. You know what I mean? So we bring ourselves up to what it is that's, that's needed. Necessity is the mother of invention, right? Is the, is the idea. So yeah. 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 What else? What else? Other questions for Mark? How you are able to differentiate some people? How do I differentiate people? So, uh, right. So this is outside the realm of the writing that we're talking about. But no, 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 no. This is that's a fantastic question because really you can use it in any of the writing that you're doing. So essentially, when you differentiate, what it is is you're taking an idea or a person or a business or something, and you're making it stand out in a way that's attractive to other people around it. So when you differentiate, it's always against something else, right? You don't differentiate in a vacuum. If you had a brand new idea, you wouldn't need to differentiate because all you'd need to do is to talk about the idea, right? Because there's no competition for the idea if it was totally brand new. But if there are competitors in that marketplace, you need to stand apart as different from them. So one of the exercises that I do with my clients and this would be a writing exercise, you know, if you guys were writing about whatever it is you're doing. I think about first, like, what are, what are, like, so let's say you wanted to differentiate a business. Now, remember, this can be about if you're writing an article about the Peloponnesian War, doesn't matter, but I'm, gonna, I'm using it as if we're talking about business. Suppose you wanted to differentiate a business, make that business stand out as better and interesting than other businesses. I would first ask someone, what would someone in the marketplace say about the type of business you're in without knowing anything about you? 
Like, what are the stereotypes that they have? Like, let's say, let's say you're, you're an architect, right? So I would say if people came to you and they knew nothing about you, but they dealt with architects before, what are all the stereotypes that they have about architects? Right, about, right, about how you do business or like how you charge or what your philosophy is. It doesn't mean that these stereotypes are right about you, but what do they think about the field in general? And then once they've written out all the stereotypes that they have about the field, then I say, okay, second part to this stereotypes exercise. We have one part, what are all the stereotypes about your field? And now the second part is what are all the ways you are different? What ideas do you have that are different from the stereotypes, stories, results? What are all the ways you are different? And then we look and we take the most interesting difference and we elevate it to the four of their business and everything revolves around that, that piece of differentiation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Does that make, uh, um, and, and just to continue this thought and then we'll go back to uh, directly to straight writing here is, so for instance, because, because you're an architect. So I once worked with a, an architect, industrial architect firm. And I said, what are the stereotypes about industrial architects? And the principal of the company said, well, the biggest stereotype of all is that, that people think of industrial architects as unreliable that we're unreliable business people, that we think of ourselves as artists, that we just care about our art form. We don't care about business. So if they call us or email us or text us, we're not going to get back to them for days and we'll go over budget and we don't care about what they want to do. We just want to build a building that's a homage to our artistic vision. So we don't care about them. We just care about ourselves and our art. And I said, okay, cool. I said, so what we need to do is if they think all architects are unreliable industrial architects, we need to make you the reliable industrial architect. So we started to gather ideas and insights and stories that they had been in business for 20 years. In 20 years, they had done almost 4,000 projects. They had 214 repeat clients, including the first client they ever had when they opened their doors 20 years earlier, the Lakewood School District. You know, on average, each repeat client hired them for 16 projects and so forth. Put together this whole thing. Yeah, we know you think industrial architects are unreliable, but we're the reliable choice. Look at this. Does that make, is that helpful? I can't hear you. You're muted, I think, right? Yeah. Yes, it's, it's a huge thing. And, and I like the way you make it fun. But for me, right. it should be also fun. If not, right. die. and thank you so much because it's, it's a good glue for me, the fun part and the way oh, yeah. the stereotype stereotype patient of architects are really funny. And I always say I was I'm a redhead born in Venezuela. I'm not normal, so right. that's my <laughs> Well, this uh, so thank you for that. So this idea of having fun. So everyone on this call, um, I tell my clients, my differentiation clients, uh, like, and I'll work with CEOs. Of major. I spoke to one client. I said, how many people do you have underneath you? He said, 400,000. Like, so major things. And I say to them, look, part of the work we're doing is to laugh and to have fun. And I say, and I mean this sincerely, I say, if we're not laughing during our sessions, that's going to be a big problem because it means we're being too serious and being too serious shuts your mind off that when you're being funny, when you're playful, you and most of you are creatives on this call, so you understand what I'm talking about. When you're funny, when you're playful, it requires that you reach out beyond what it is that you normally think about. So being overly serious is the death of good ideas. You have to have fun, you have to be playful, you have to digress, all those things, right? So thank you for that, the pointing out the fun part, yeah. All right. Yeah. Oh, well. it, uh, I think that's an interesting point, Mark. And I wonder, um, we, we, our group is not that we're not laughing that much. I think we're having a lot of fun. That's why people come right, back. Right. But sometimes um, we're activating stories that are really 
painful from the past. So we've had tears and things like that. Right. And of course, some laughs, but um, I, I'm, my mind goes to this um, one session that I had. It was like a social group. We had like a laughing event. Like we all had right. to go down to a room and start laughing. I don't know. There's things like laughing yoga, but maybe that I can find some creative way to combine laughing and free writing. Well, <laughs> I'll well, work on that. That's right. I love that. But like this idea of that there were tears. Depends on the prompt, Ray. Right, exactly. <laughs> right, that's right. Um, but like this idea of tears. So when I say you should be laughing and having fun, it doesn't mean every second that you need to be. But I. But one of the things that, that Ray, you citing that points out to me and me talking about like hysterical laughter uh, uh, during stuff, is that we're talking about going to extremes, going to something that's so sad and true for you that you're in tears about it or growing, going to something that's so bizarre and funny that you're in tears from laughing. Free writing to me is very, very, very much about going to extremes that in the writing, you should push, push, push your way beyond reality to what stuff's happening. You know, um, um, I lead for on, you guys have, any of you have seen the, the American series Mad Men, right? About ad agencies, right? From the 1960s. So Mad Men as in Madison Avenue men, as in Madison Avenue, that's where all the ad agencies are on Madison Avenue in Manhattan. So I have actually led brainstorming sessions for big ad firms on Madison Avenue. And one of the things I do, it's overtly, I operationalize going to extremes. Like I'll say to them in a brainstorming session, I'll say, okay, we want to, why don't, instead of coming up with good ideas, because we've tried to come up with good ideas, let's come up with really bad ideas, because maybe that'll liberate us by coming up with bad ideas. And as a matter of fact, let's look at different types of bad ideas. So the first type I want us to look at right now are what are some bad ideas that are just so boring that we'd fall asleep if we executed on them? And so they give us like some, you know, like really boring ideas. And I said, okay, great. Now, what are some litigious ideas, ideas for ad campaigns or so that if we use them, we're sure to get sued. Like for certain, we're not going to use them, but if we did use them, we'd be in big trouble. And so what are those? Okay, great. Now, what are some ideas that, uh, um, for, that, are, that are physically dangerous? Like someone is physically going to get hurt. And so we come up with all these different ideas, right? Right, there's your prop. What are some bad ideas? We come up with all these ideas. We're not gonna use ideas where people physically get hurt or get sued or boring or whatnot, but it liberates people from their normal path because they're going to extremes. Mm -hmm. And so they think of interesting ideas, ideas they wouldn't have thought any other way. And then they take one of those extreme ideas and they make it more centrist, more palatable. They bring it back to where they are and th then it becomes usable, mm -hmm. right? Does that make sense? So that to me puts the crying and the laughing together. Interesting, interesting. All right. I think that's a great place to move into the writing part. So Mark, would you like to select a prompt for us today? And I hope that you will stay and do the writing with us, but if you need to go on, yeah, I totally yeah. understand. Yeah, no, of course. And you can um, also do a reading from your book if you want to that leads up to the prompt, for instance. I can just open my book anywhere and uh, <laughs> let's see. Uh, I hadn't thought about prompts. Um, uh, what I, let's see. Or from uh, the group, we can get some samples in the chat too, if you guys have well, ideas. Right. I, I'm thinking about, um, I'm thinking about, so whatever problem if there's a problem that you're facing right now, right? This is to everyone in the group. And it can be a personal problem or a business problem or a problem about a specific project or a specific relationship or something like that. Um, I would, in, in light of what it is that we're talking about right now, I would want you to write about what are some bad ideas about how to approach that. 
about how to solve the problem. Okay. What are, and, and I don't just mean, don't just sit there and list bad ideas. I mean, narratively, write about, okay, I'm going to think about problem X. This guy, Mark, says, think about, okay, so I'm going to think about this problem I'm having at work. Okay, so what are some bad ideas? And then, you know, you start writing about them and whatever bad idea most captures your attention, start writing about that. But the, but the key is to me is, is um, like when you feel drawn, like allow for digression. When you feel drawn to write about something else in the writing, just drop the prompt and go on to something else. Like don't feel confined by the prompt. The prompt is really just the thing to get you into space. You know, it's that initial thrust to get you into the atmosphere. And then once you're in the atmosphere, right, the, the tail of the rocket ship falls off. It falls back to Earth because now you don't need that. So, like, just keep on writing, you know, once you've written about that. Is that cool, Ray? Yeah, I like that. Yeah. I like that. Okay, so I put it into the chat. I have my trusty timer here. So I'm going to set it on 25 minutes. Okay. And I... Um, so let's see if there's anyone who's completely new that would be Sachi. What we do is we, we go on um, mute, but leave our videos on and we write to the prompt. And once you get into space, then just keep going, <laughs> right? And it doesn't matter which planet you land on, right? <laughs> just, right. it's interesting, keep writing about it. And it's about volume, getting words on paper and not self-editing or criticizing or anything like that. And then I'll give you a two minute warning before the 25 minutes is up. And then we can talk about the experience. And if someone would like to share from their writing can do so. So thanks again to you, Mark, for that okay. great intro and cool. wish you a happy writing session, everybody. Do, 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 do. Okay. Welcome back. Okay. When you say welcome back, it's sort of like a trans session that is ending, you know, you're getting, it's like you're hypnotized and you're taking us back into the real world. Very, very... Yeah, sometimes that just naturally comes out too when I say, see you on the other side. You know, it's some sort of tunnel metaphor or going to a different state. Yeah. So either Vikas is very tired or he's in a different state. <laughs> All right, so. Carola, I don't think you've come to free writing before. Would you like to share with us what your experience was? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I was in your workshop, but I never joined your free writing session. And I must say, I'm, I've been positively surprised. And I, uh, I like Mark's approach to start with a problem with a negative situation and a bad idea, because in writing about bad ideas, you, um, you manifest good ideas or you you manifest that you shouldn't really do these best bad ideas and uh, I think um, you you almost while writing about bad ideas you come up with some solutions and I think the whole process is is uh, more creative than I expected you know uh, so it's it's uh, by writing, there is more structure and clarity than just by thinking about it. And it's in a way a manifestation, you know, that you don't have if you just reflect on things. I mean, I, I must really say it has been a good, very positive experience and I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised. That's great. Mark, I'll let you respond to that. Thank you, Karol. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah. So uh, yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, I I always I in so so a lot of creatives who I know, including myself, um, uh, we don't like to do what we're told. 
So, you know, you, you instantly want to make something your own. You want to push against it, you know, or, or so. Uh, and so to me, writing about something that's not normally written about is already freeing immediately. So when I'm working with clients and if I say, so what is it that you want to see happen here? And sometimes they don't know. So then I'll say, okay, what do you want? What don't you want to see happen here? Like, let's talk about that first. Or let's say I'm leading people in brainstorming good ideas. So if the ideas, if they feel a bit shut down coming up with, with ideas, I said, okay, let's not brainstorm any ideas at all. Let's just brainstorm every possible question like big questions, small questions, questions about different parts of the situation. You're not going to have to answer any of these questions. They're not like, if you want to write a couple of them down, great, but I'm not going to recording them. We're not writing them on any flip chart or whatnot. It's just to get you to question every part of the situation, because I find that people will often only look at parts of the situation that they feel that they have an answer for. And if like they're scared to look at parts that they feel they might not be prepared to answer. And so rather than pretending those parts don't exist, brainstorming just questions allows them to look at everything, knowing they won't have to go the next step and supply answers, but it gets their mind going. So this kind of thing, this idea of looking at negatives, what's working, what's not working, what are bad ideas, da, da, da. What are questions? What are like, it instantly helps our ability to be creative by just like focusing on one small rule that goes in a different direction. Yeah, I mean, I must say, I, I, what you said at the beginning was right for me. When I wrote down the bad ideas, it was like in my head, but you're not going to do this, you know? Right, right. And it's like, you know, it's, and it was funny. Uh, I mean, I, I really enjoyed that. Cool. Oh, that's great. That's great. Thank you. Anyone else like to share about the experience? For me, it was quite liberating and I had a lot of fun because my brain is like a, like a popcorn machine, really crazy with the ideas. And I wrote like, send carrion pigeons, send mafiosos to pressure the people. And it was so funny because it, it took out the serious thing and then ni, 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 ni. I say, mm, let's send out of the blue crazy things. And now I'm like, oh, and then came an idea which was not expected about make the thing sense I can say this then it's not the German, English word is not working a sensorial experience which is missing and then it got the glue sending carrion pigeons and mafioso to pressure the people and some other funny crazy things so thank you it's like I am liberated <laughs> I love it thank you Okay, anyone else? Jorte. Thought this this was mind-boggling because you you start thinking about bad ideas and then you your mind immediately starts to push back. But what's a better idea? Or why would this be such a bad idea? Or maybe if you if you alterated it and it might become a really good idea. So that it frees up so much creativity just because you push back. You don't want bad ideas in your life. Right, um, right, right. Well said. I love that. So that was, um, and I, I love the popcorn machine in my brain. Uh, that's such a, such a nice way to put it. <laughs> Thank you for that metaphor. I have, I have a question, um, if mm. if I may, but maybe um, we can save that to later. And you, um, Ray, you you ask the other participants first. Okay. Well, does anyone else want to um, say anything or read anything? Otherwise, so for we're me coming also, to... yeah. So for me, also same thing happened. That uh, initially, I started writing about the bad idea that what I was doing doing wrong previously. And immediately those good ideas started coming up that this was not to be done and this is what should be done. But another interesting thing happened that during this journey while I was writing and when I was like, like completed with the good ideas, I immediately again started thinking about again a bad idea. 
<laughs> that okay okay this was also the bad thing which i was doing and then again after some time good ideas started coming out oh that's interesting i love it i love it right right so it's interesting uh, it's a well, interesting process so why yeah. do you think that you went to bad idea the second time what it, what did that do for you somehow i was not getting the good ideas so i thought that probably if that is a artistic way of discovering the good ideas then let me think and go back to bad idea if mark can give me that prompt i can right. give myself that prompt if that prompt works <laughs> right right yeah i, I mean cuz it sounds to me so that's great uh, uh, every, what everyone's saying is wonderful um like it sounds like it, you know it takes the pressure off You know, I mean like oh these good ideas aren't so great. The hell with good ideas. Why? All right, let me just like go where my mind is going. My mind's not giving me good ideas. It's giving me bad ideas. So let me just keep going in that direction. But like, you know, go off the edge to bad ideas. It's like yeah. you know. Yeah. So um, thank you. Thank you um, yeah. 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 It, it, it's like with me, I was I have to create a new magic show. and so i was writing about the situation and um like i realized that the person that we'd be doing a magic show for like they probably had these amazing cars you know like lamborghinis and things like that so i said okay so what tricks can i do well uh, uh what tricks can we do with the cars it's like it's oh well yeah Well, no, no. See, that's a good <laughs> trick. That's a good trick. What I went to is, well, we can have like the guy get in the car and like like pick someone in the audience to run over. Have him like run that person over. We can lock him in the trunk and like in other words, nothing I we'd ever do. We would never do any of those things, but I came to some really good ideas because it was like, okay, bad ideas. run them over a lock them in the trunk like mash the lamborghini right exactly that's right that's it right bang the cars together exactly you know like yeah um or like give him like uh, uh, give him uh, uh like a screwdriver and have him like like deface his own car or something like that and like you know but like what happens with that so anyway it's that kind of stuff that was freeing yeah wonderful okay yeah. dorote you wanted to say something Yeah, I also wanted to add to that. If you um, really go down that path, if you really approach the bad idea, um, make it very, very concrete, um, you start understanding why this might be part of the solution, or why you, you know, why it wasn't such a bad idea at, at all. That you just need to turn a few screws, and then it turns out to be something very valuable. That's, oh, that's absolutely. Something I didn't expect be before we we started that. Oh, yeah. If you guys research it, there are so many things that have been invented in the world that started out as mistakes. Uh -huh. They started I, and I by the way, I remember interviewing uh I mean this is a very minor thing, but I remember 20 years ago I was I was uh, I was for a magazine I was interviewing a juggler who had won there's the world championships of juggling like there's a juggling competition and this guy had a very bizarre routine with like boxes and balls and the balls would be rolling down his arm he'd like catch balls and he put one here while he was catching another and this one's real and so he's going back and forth like grabbing things and throwing them up in the air and whatnot and i asked him how he came up with such an imaginative routine and he said well it started as a mistake he said i was practicing and i missed a ball and it started to roll down my arm and the first thing i did was curse at myself about how stupid i was but then i realized oh that might be interesting so i tried to duplicate that mistake and that became the genesis of his giant routine you know like but these ideas i don't remember what they all are but like penicillin like i forget who it is some a scientist dropping on his shoe and it like ate through the shoe and he realized it would eat through something else and you know like if you just punch up inventions mistakes 
you know, Most you're going to find- Jesus, in fact. Jeez, right. <laughs> that's right. That's right. People left stuff overnight. It's like, oh, wow, that's interesting. <laughs> I didn't expect it to do that. Because if we only follow what we expect to happen, we're just going to get the same results over and over again. So it is essential that you make mistakes and even deliberate mistakes. You know, it, like you just have to, otherwise you're going to get the same stuff. Interesting. All right. Great. Thank you so much for your inspiration, Mark, for your time. Thank you. Very Thank much you. appreciated. Well, uh, yeah, Vikas has something. Yeah. Uh, so just a quick question, because uh, as you, Mark, you have worked with such world-class people and brands. So Is your question about buying my book in bulk? Yes, you can. <laughs> if you go to Amazon, yes, because you could buy I, I've, I've even already searched for it once. Yes. yes, I've already searched for it on Google. Oh, all right, good. So it's okay. going to be that part. Right. So uh, just curious that, yeah. So as you work with world-class people and brands, so in your experience, how do you differentiate them that what truly makes them world-class? What are those characteristics or factors that differentiate these people from others? Oh, um, because you have B-world class, right? So, um, you know, and I'm happy to talk to you about this offline. Um, so this idea of what, of what makes them world class, I've never thought about it in a, in a blanket way. It's because you're asking me like, a, like kind of a blanket question. What I predominantly do is what is the thing that people are going to talk about even when you're not around? Like, what's the thing they're going to share? What's the thing that they're going to be excited to talk about? And usually that thing, it, it, um, um, it, it, it's, it's got to be something that's, that, um, uh, like imagine them going to a restaurant and just that their friends are there. And they say, oh, yeah, so I met this guy, Vikas, and he did this, and you won't believe this. And it's like, what is that thing? And you may have that thing already, or you may need to manufacture something that gets talked about. A, a, a really, do, uh, 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 Ray, do I have another couple of minutes? Yeah, talk? sure. Yeah. So like the way uh, this is to answer your question. So that show, Chamber Magic, that's the number one live show in New York City on TripAdvisor. So when Steve and I, he, we both created the show together and this is 20 years ago, Steve would perform the tricks. And then afterwards I'd go into the audience while people were putting their jackets on. And I just say, oh, I'm with the show. I'm really interested. What trick did you like best? And I just, it wasn't a formal focus group. It was just like me bugging them, you know, like, oh yeah, what, what did you, it would, it would help me. What trick did you like best? And I talked to three or four people on the way out. And if, if a trick, if there was a trick over the course of weeks and months that they didn't talk about, Steve and I would pull it out of the show. And we'd either retool that trick or we'd get rid of it because we didn't have a lot of money back then. And the tricks needed to act as missionaries for the show. Like the tricks had to be so cool that people were going to talk to their friends about them. And if people weren't talking to me about a trick right after seeing it, they weren't going to talk to their friends about it like a day or two later. So wow. with each trick, each trick had to have like this freak out factor that people would just want to discuss when we weren't around. And by the way, another point, just to answer your, your thing, because um, magic, there's a famous magician of the 20th century named Di Vernon, who said, confusion is not magic. That if the audience is confused as to what happened, they may be fooled, but they won't be astonished. Right. So those are two different things. You want them astonished. You don't want, you, you know, like you don't want them just fooled and saying, yeah, I don't know how he did it, but it wasn't great. You want them a, like drop slack jawed. So so to me, like not only was I listening to hear what tricks they talked about, 
but I wanted to hear if they could talk about the tricks themselves. Because if the trick was too complex and in talking to me about it, they couldn't really discuss it. I knew they wouldn't talk to friends about it because they wouldn't want to look stupid to their friends. So if they couldn't talk about a trick, Steve and I would retool the trick so it became simpler to talk about. So it would freak people out. They'd want to talk about it. But the premise was so clear that they could then talk about it after. Does that make sense? It's the same thing with your business. It's the exact same thing. What are the things that are going to freak people out? There's some things there or there's some things you need to manufacture. And is the stuff simple enough? Do they have language for it? They want to talk about it and they're able to talk about it. So I hope that's helpful. So oh, cool, cool, cool. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah. Thanks for the question. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, if I can get